Hello and welcome to a brand new edition of Inside Out on the Road, a show where we focus on individual stocks with in-depth analysis, deep dive into the financials and tell you about the key risks and triggers going forward. So let's not waste any time and get to our first stock today. My colleague Nigel gets us this very special deep dive on Thomas Cook. Well, Thomas Cook is a leading omni-channel travel company here in India, but it has presence across the globe. Well, the company is promoted by Fairbridge Capital, which is a subsidiary of Fairfax Group, who trimmed their stake by 8.5% in late 2023. But as the shareholding is suggesting, well, there are a couple of large investors in there. Let's break the business down for you. The financial services business includes wholesale as well as retail services, like prepaid card issuances, forex for leisure, and international money transfer. The travel services are into corporate travel, MICE, leisure travel, and DMS. There's also the leisure hospitality segment, which houses Sterling Resorts. And finally, Digiphoto Imaging Services, that houses Digiphoto Entertainment Imaging, which was acquired in October 2019. For the first nine months of the year, well, they have achieved 5,600 crores of revenues with EBIT margins of around 7.5%. And in their segmental breakup, travel and related services contribute bulk of their revenues but financial services and leisure has relatively better margins. Well, the focus of the group has been on improving margins by productivity enhancement via technology and benefits of cost re-engineering. The DMS segment, well, that was loss making when it was acquired, but it has turned it on successfully. While the Sterling Holidays Resorts, well, that underwent a transformation in its business model from focus on timeshare to a more resort centric approach. Well, the cash consists of cash from operations, but bulk of it is float balance, which is the unutilized money loaded onto prepaid cards. Well, let's not waste any more time. Mr. Menon is standing by to explain the business in further detail and give us how he expects business to shape up from here on. Thank you so much. Pleasure to meet you, Nigel. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, Mr. Menon, thanks so much for coming on Inside Out here on CNBC TV 18. You know, before we get to business, I wanted to understand how do you see the entire travel and tourism business shaping up here in India? There are various levers, right? It's no longer seasonal as a percentage of your wallet share, well, it's constituting a larger part. And also you have religious uh, tourism now. That's another kicker. Tell us how are things shaping up and also tell us the average age of your customer. I believe that's come down. Tell us more. So Nigel, first of all, thank you for having me on the show. Look, uh, when I see travel, uh, it takes me sometimes to a place where I wonder what new is going to happen every day. Mm -hmm. Very honestly, what we've witnessed over the last two years post pandemic is something new and it's always positive. Mm -hmm. You see, it's no longer, you or when you say something new, you always, there's a negativity to it. But here we actually find ourselves in a spot mm -hmm. where travel is, is exploding, if I can use the word. And it's no longer optional. It's not optional. It's no longer, uh, it's become whimsical. Mm -hmm. It's become instant gratification. It's become a variety of things. Destinations are no longer a guide to where somebody wants to go for a holiday. Indeed. So earlier, if you talked about a short weekend, you said, okay, I will go to Goa. Mm -hmm. Or if I was in Delhi, I'd say I'd go to Shimla, I'll go to Kasauli. Yeah. If I was in the east, I would say that I'd go up to the hills. Indeed. The reality is today, that short weekend can mean a trip to Dubai, Abu Dhabi. It can mean a trip into Mauritius. Yeah. Um, very often what I say is that people are now researching their requirements much more. Mm -hmm. As a result of which we find that it is no longer that age bracket of 35 to 45 that we're catering to. We're actually seeing an eight to 10 year drop in the average age. Post COVID, we, we now sell holidays through a call center, which we did earlier, but at an intensity that is far greater than we witnessed. People come and buy holidays online. Yes. People come and research and then land up in our branch, or we get the 
old quality uh, people, uh, people who used to come earlier, come and land in our branch and say, I want a holiday. You just uh, told us about long and short haul. I believe long haul is still to recover to pre-COVID levels. So as a percentage of that, how much is it at? And you're seeing a fair bit of traction on short haul. What does this mean for the business in terms of profitability? Because cost cutting you've already taken, and also you have operating leverage that could play out. So tell us more about that. So long haul will always be an integral part of our business because the average ticket transaction yes. size is much bigger. The reality is that as we see long haul coming back, our expectation is that you will see our volumes grow. Indeed. Um, as far as uh, the profit margins are concerned, yes, as long haul comes back and given the fact that we will sustain cost cuts the way they were because we replaced costs with technology and productivity, yeah. I expect our margins to increase, especially in the leisure space. And as a percentage long haul, as a percentage of pre-COVID period, how much is it? We, 65, we, 70 percent? 60, about, we've recovered 62 or 63 percent. So when the US and Europe comes back full swing, my expectation is the upside will be driven by to, to some extent by that. Okay. But before I end my answer, I also want to talk about incentives. Mm. Because incentives is a major driver in this space. Uh, we had a record year for Thomas Cook and SOTC uh, in terms of the incentives they did. Uh, we held on to our margins. Mm. We did the G20. Yes. The last part is the corporate, where it has been... It started very well because domestic travel in amongst corporates is back to normal. But what is missing is long haul travel there also. And as that comes in, we will see higher volumes. You will see higher mar margins. Okay, all right. Let's talk about your financial services and your forex exchange part of the business. In revenue terms, it is relatively smaller. But in margin terms, it's quite high. So give us a couple of aspects. What is your market share in the prepaid card segment, point number one? And point number two is, you've done phenomenally well because margins have moved closer to around the 40% the mark. Can it hold in this vicinity? So in foreign exchange, I think we've seen several changes. We've diversified our product offering. Yes. Today, we just don't um, sell foreign exchange to a traveler. Mm. We provide uh, remittances for students. Uh, we provide support for students, uh, various other forms. There's, I'm not sure you're aware, but there's a new RBI circular on the way. Indeed. Where we there's will a be, consultation paper yeah, that's on, yeah, which could be beneficial yeah, to which us. Is, which is going to help us, Indeed. more so because that uh, sees us being allowed to handle trade payments up to a particular limit. Absolutely. So, you know, I, I think the opportunities on the foreign exchange side remain very good mm -hmm. because more and more Indians want to travel abroad to study. And more and more Indians want to travel abroad. Uh, if we are allowed a little more flexibility in terms of the license, as in when this new regulation comes in, I actually see a significant benefit. Coming back to the card, yes. uh, today we are one of the leading distributors of the cards. And when I say leading distributor, we're competing with the banks. We are no longer competing with anyone else. Because you'll appreciate we issue our own card, mm. unlike any, any other non-bank right. who has to go to a bank to get a bin. As far as we're concerned, we issue our own card. We settle it. The float sits with us. So that's, that's the difference. And there we have become a major player. And we will continue to expand this space because both corporates as well as re retail people you know, people want to care, may have a debit card, may have a credit card, but they want something. Uh, this fa fear of rejection mm. is very high on an average Indian. Indeed. And you'll appreciate limits in credit cards are relatively low. Yes. Uh, there could be some problem on uh, a system, so your debit card doesn't get honored. Prepaid cards, the transaction is done at the, it's stored on the card. Yes. It's done by the issue of Visa or MasterCard and nobody else. So you are fairly safe from that. You want to quantify what is the market share as of now in the prepaid card so, segment? So we have approximately 25 or 26 percent okay. of the market yes. by our uh, data. It tells us that. We also believe that the margins are sustainable, sustainable. Uh, for a variety of reasons. Because um, I think once you've achieved economies of scale, then you can. I'm not saying we are a bank where you yeah. go and say take it or leave it. But the reality is that our rates are fairly stable. And given that the bulk of it is on the card, we are able to focus on that.
Well, Mr. Menon, you know, the other part of the business that's done very well is the Sterling Resorts. And you've changed the way you're running the business out there. From a timeshare, you've got it more into a resort-centric business. So that's looking good, but give us three aspects. One, how do you see occupancies move up from these mid-60% odd? The ADRs, do you see it has potential to move up? And since it's doing so well, do you think that at some point of time you could look at demerging that business? So, Nigel, I think uh, let's address item by item. We are adding capacity. Mm -hmm. uh, we are trying to add a hotel a month, okay. maybe two hotels a quarter. And our objective is to get to about 65 hotels by 2025. <coughs> now, what's happening is that a couple of years ago, two years ago, we made a decision that, you know, uh, that the timeshare business, because of a variety of things, did not stack up properly for us. So we, uh, the management at Sterling decided to go into hospitality. We changed our model completely, moved away from trying to lease hotels into getting into management contracts. But our core offering, which was to remain a resort, yes. was unchanged. Okay. So what's happened is today we have about 3,000 odd rooms, and our objective is to get to about 5,000 rooms. Now, two things are going to happen. Um, as far as the occupancy is concerned, if we keep adding, yes. obviously we will have to, it will give us the opportunity of renovating rooms, taking the new rooms and operating with them. Yeah. Um, so our expectation is that the uh, occupancy rates will go back to about 65-67% mm -hmm. as our acquisitions settle down. Right. The ADRs are a function of supply and demand. Right. And when you run a resort, normally it's a weekend when the resort fills up. During the week, we have to find ways and means of achieving it. But okay. despite that, we are at a 6,000 odd ADR. Uh, my expectation is that as the rates go up around the country in the hospitality sector, mm -hmm. this will keep going up. To what level? You think it would go, go to 7,500 odd? Yeah, I think we should be realistically somewhere in that range. Do you think that the, since the business has such good prospects, could you look at demerging it? Or that's not on the table? Well, it's not on the table as we talk. Uh, however, you know, in our group, we are constantly looking at opportunities. To unlock value for shareholders? Unlock value. Uh, we look at, we, we are the sole shareholder in this particular case. Uh -huh. uh, but the reality is that Ultimately, we have to figure out what to do with the respective businesses. Right now, Sterling is associated with us because we not only provide occupants for their hotels, it's an adjoining business for us and therefore offers an opportunity. Um, it's an essential earner in our group. Yes. But I would believe that given the current market trends, it's something that we will consider at some stage. I don't know when. You know, the other smaller part of the business which is growing, where you have 50% stake, is the imaging solutions. Mm -hmm. And out there you'll have roughly around 50-51% stake. Are there any plans to increase stake in that? No, not at all. 49% okay. uh, is with the entrepreneur who founded and built this business. Okay. And we wanted to give him skin in the game okay. so that he could grow that business. Got it. Got it. Well, what does it mean now? Now, you've spoken about all the aspects of business. Could you tell us, as a consolidated entity, what kind of revenue growth are you looking at on a decent base of FY24? So for FY25, what is the revenue growth? And EBIT margins are in that vicinity of around 7, 7.5%. Is there an upside risk there? Yes. So uh, I think the first thing we want to grow our top line. Mm -hmm. And as long haul comes back in, yes. as corporate travel comes back in, as the new changes in the foreign exchange business come back in, I think there is potential to grow that top line by 20%. Okay. If we maintain margins where they are, They'll grow. Revenues will also grow by a proportionate amount. Um, that's our f objective right now because you know we uh, we want to be realistic. Yes. Businesses have come back. Uh, growing margins simultaneously may not be the best idea at the end of the day. Stable margins with 20% growth in FI25. Yeah. Well, Mr. Menon, 20% looks like a good growth on a rather high base. Could you tell us all of this is going to be organic, or do you have some inorganic plans? So right now it's going to be organic, okay. uh, Nigel. I, I think given all the disruption that we went through, yeah. I think you need to catch your breath uh, <laughs> again. And we have done a large amount of acquisitions okay. pre-COVID. Uh, my view is if we make an acquisition, it's got to be, it's got to make strategic sense to us. I don't see anything at the moment. Okay. 
Okay. And therefore, I think we are happy to settle for organic growth, mm -hmm. which will allow us to consolidate ourselves again. Okay. And then we'll look at it as well. Well, give and take everything with the operating leverage as well coming into play. The ROC, where will it head? Because as of now, it's quite subdued at less than 10%. I think it's mid-single digits. What's the target out there? Our target is to get to 15%. And I believe it is achievable because once we get over the lag of COVID, we've got the productivity, we've got the cash generation ability, we will come back into the business. And, you know, my expectation is that I've, I've got uh, return on equity hurdles which my shareholder wants. Yeah. So I think we, we have a plan to get there, and the ROC will definitely get into the mid numbers as all businesses start firing. I mean, right. if I just look at it, if, I, if my long haul starts coming back, if our overseas businesses, which bring tourists into their respective countries, which is again long haul, mm -hmm. comes back, top line gets achieved, margins we're holding on to, ultimately the, all that cash drops to this thing. Today, for the first time this year, uh, our entire Profit is our cash generation. Indeed. And that to me is, is the recognition that we can do much better. Let's also knock off a couple of other points. You know, the promoter entity came in there and they offered close to around 8.5% uh, in the market in late 2023. Do they have plans on selling more stake or uh, are they done and they're comfortable with this early 60% so that they have? In 2021, they increased their stake. Uh, by offering us an amount of money as fresh capital, as support during COVID. Mm -hmm. So at the end of COVID, when our businesses rebounded and our share prices started going up, they came in and said that they'd like to sell an equivalent stake uh, or the number, you know, the amount, consolidated amount. So we agreed to that. And so what they've done is effectively, while the absolute number of shares has gone up, yes. uh, the percentage has come down. Uh, but the reality is my shareholder doesn't believe is a long-term shareholder. Yes. So they have no intention of coming down from this. And any dilution will have to be thought through very, very carefully. I, I'm very happy where they are. Okay. And I suspect that they are very happy where they are. Right? Well, let's wind this down then. You have a fair bit of cash. Some part of that is because of the float that is in the system. But could you tell us the debt is at around 300 crores, gross debt. Plans on becoming debt-free soon? So if you look at the debt, it's essentially ECLGS loans, which we took during COVID. Yes. Uh, we'd love to repay it today. We have enough money mm -hmm. with 1,300 odd crores to have the ability of repaying it. Yes. Uh, but the banks obviously want us to hold on to it. They, uh, they, I think we'll get to pay it some starting next year. Okay. So, you know, look, it's or sometimes it's good to have long-term debt on your books uh, in terms of a balance sheet. But we essentially treat ourselves as debt-free because that money, we've got de fixed deposits also yes. lying in the bank. So the reality is we're trying to balance all this as much as we can, leverage that cost in some form or the other by building revenue. But the reality is tomorrow if we're allowed to repay it, we'll repay it. Well, it's been a pleasure speaking to you, Mr. Menon. Thanks Thank so you. much for Thank speaking to us here on Thank CNBC you. TV. Today. Thank you. All right, that was a deep dive into Thomas Cook, but time to slip into a short break. We'll come back with another interesting stock, Techno, Electric and Engineering. That is the stock in the spotlight. Welcome back. You're still tuned into Inside Out and this is our Swatlight segment. And in this segment, we have Techno Electric, which is on our radar. It is a power infrastructure company which is present across the power value chain. It is into EPC for power generation, transmission and distribution, industrial sector and also data centers. So it spans from generation to distribution, then to transmission, the exchanges and then the metering in terms of smart meter manufacturing. It has key customers like Adani Transmission, you have Power Grid, REC, Power Distribution, Tata Chemicals, BHEL, Alstom, and Hindalco, to name a few. And the competitors include LNT, Engineers India, Reliance Infra, Vari Renewables, KC, Power Mech Projects, Kaltaru Power as well. Let's first talk about financials and then we'll discuss the other aspects of the business as well. After seeing a strong FY22 with revenues of 1,074 crore, there was a fall in FY23 to 829 crores. But now in nine months, FY24 companies back to FY22 levels. Similar is the story with profits, which are at 283 crores in nine months FY24, which is similar to FY22 levels. Margins, however, are around 13%. This is after falling to 10% mark after 20% margins in FY22. 
Now, nine-month FY24 order book stands at around 5400 crore rupees, with transmission at 2058 crore rupees, FGDs at 1361 crore rupees, smart meters at 1600 crores, and data center at 1400 crore rupees. The company is expanding, and there is a lot of thrust from the government in the power sector as well. Now, in the transmission segment, companies targeting 2,000 crore rupees every year in flue gas desulfurization or the FGD segment for thermal power plants, it is targeting 1,000 crore rupees every year. Big opportunity in smart meters and data center as well. In smart meters, it is targeting 2,000 to 2,500 crore rupees every year, and in data centers, around 11,250 crore rupees. This is over the next seven years. MK thinks data center is a big opportunity and values the business at 251 rupees per share out of its target price of 1050 rupees uh, per share. Now, let's talk about the balance sheet. The ratios look quite stretched. Debtor day is at 282, creditor at 303 and inventory day is at 59. The company has sizable cash in the books at 1400 crore rupees, which will be used for expansion and also some of it has been used for dividend payout as dividend payout has increased to 35% in FY23 versus just 8% in FY22. The promoters hold 61.51% share and sizable portion is held by mutual funds at almost 24%. The FPIs hold around 3.1%. The stock trades at 27.6 times one-year forward earnings. Okay, with that, we have run out of time on this edition of Inside Out. It's a goodbye from Nigel and I, but as always, do write to us and tell us the companies you want us to discuss and you want to hear about. And we'll try to feature these on our show. Thanks a lot for tuning in.